My name is Terry Covey, and I'm the pastor of Twin Oaks Baptist Church. This message that you are about to hear was delivered at Twin Oaks. We pray that it will be a blessing to you, and if there are any questions that you may have or any way that we may be of help to you, please feel free to contact us. God bless you, and have a great day. Amen. I can listen to Christmas music all year, literally. Tracy gets aggravated with it because as soon as it makes logical sense, it stays on 24-7. So I love it. Um, if we could, let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning um, before we get started. Heavenly Father, thank you for, um, thank you for grace. So we're going to spend some time just digging into that idea and that of the grace that came with you and the, the new covenant that's found in you, Christ. I, I just thank you for that. Holy Spirit, I pray that, that my words that come out of my mouth uh, be yours. Let, Lord, I pray that, that your Holy Spirit will speak through me. Um, help me to do this sermon well. Let, help me to uh, handle the text well, Lord. And Father, just... Um, in just a mighty way, Lord, I just pray that you move on our hearts and our minds and our lives, that we are transformed by your word this morning. Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's your name we pray. Amen. So, uh, sometime last week, Tracy told me about a video that she had seen on YouTube where some African children in a very isolated part of Africa saw the first white man they had ever seen before. They had never, they've never seen a white person. They, they didn't know what that looked like. And he comes into the village. And they're fascinated by him. They're, they're like touching his arms because they, they don't have hair on their arms. And, and he bends down and he shakes his head and they take off screaming and they think it's like an animal on top of his head. And they're just, they're just enamored by this person. And the reason is they've, they've never seen that before. They don't know what that looks like. You know, we, we don't really have a... A compartment to think that through we we're aware of we live in a melting pot we see different ethnicities but if you're in an isolated area like that in Africa you don't know what to expect when you see that and and here's the thing many times we get kind of overwhelmed like those kids with things and sometimes it's good sometimes it's bad like Thanksgiving if you're anything like me you see the spread of food and you are quickly overwhelmed and and you begin to eat and eat and eat and then when you're done eating, you are overwhelmed negatively as you eat tums and tums to make it through the night. So many of us have that happen, but this is what causes us to be overwhelmed. You see, our lives normally are kind of just consistent. We kind of do the same things each week. We go to the same jobs. We normally travel the same roads. Our families conduct themselves in a similar manner. But the thing that overwhelms us is when something changes. When something's not part of the normal pattern, when things are different than they normally are. Like if, for any of you that ever went to the Grand Canyon for the first time, and you walk out and see it, it just, you just have to stop in amazement because you've never seen anything like that before. Or, or at a, 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 like a wedding or a, you know, so a child is born, it just takes you away because it's not part of the normal routine of life. And so this morning I'm going to talk about when this happened in the Bible, which is the coming of Christ with the new covenant. There was a change in covenant. Things had changed and looking at how we navigate that change. And this is the main point this morning I'm going to talk about. That Jesus came with the new covenant and it was abundant and overflowing. Very simple. The new covenant is abundant and overflowing. So for any of us that may not have a background in church, when we talk about covenant... We pretty much mean a contract. God has made a, made a contract with a promise. If you will do this, this is how I will respond. Now, here's the thing. The old covenant had an idea that God said to Abraham, I'm making a covenant with you. I will bless all nations because of you. And he begins to add these laws. And we go into the latter parts of the first five books of the Old Testament. And, and God begins to add these laws, and we need to do this, or this, or this. And, and you must do this. You must clean your hair this way. Your hair must look like this. Your clothes must be like this. You can't eat this. You can't eat this. And what happened was, man began to realize they could not keep God's law. God knew this was going to happen. He didn't do it and like, oh man, I messed this one up. He knew giving this law was something that men could never keep. 
And there had to be a greater covenant to come, which is the new covenant found in Jesus Christ in the New Testament. That's why uh, the, we have two sections of our Bible. The Old Testament or the Old Covenant and the New Testament or New Covenant is what that means. So I wanted to talk about that this morning. So if you have your Bibles, open up to John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. John chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. Now, both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. And when they ran out of wine, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. Jesus said to her, Woman, what does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Whatever he says, you do it. Now, there were, uh, there were set there six water pots of stone, according to the manner of purification for the Jews, containing, uh, you, you may see numbers, if not, but it's containing around 20 to 30 gallons apiece, is what the size of these pots were. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and did not know where it come from, but the servants had drawn the water new. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have well drunk, then the inferior. You have kept the good wine until now. This was the beginning. You may see miracles, but maybe a better use of that word would be signs. Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So before we get in the text, I will preface two things this text is not about. One of them is either the allowance or the prohibition of alcohol within the Christian life. That's not what this text is about. That's not the purpose of this. And secondly, it's not really a discussion on the nature or the makeup of what the wine was, whether it was fermented, whether it was not. I would be glad to give you arguments on both sides of the fence and give you some great resources. But if we focus on that in this text, we will miss the beauty of what Christ is showing here with this sign at the wedding at Cana. So I just wanted to preface that. That's not going to be the, the function of this. But this is what it's, what's really happening here. Um, you don't have to turn there, but John 20, 31, John gives his thesis of what he's writing about. And he says... I recorded these signs, I recorded these miracles to show you that, that he's, Jesus is the God-man. I mean, that's a, kind of a lay, lay way of saying that, but that Jesus is the God-man. He is, he's the one, he's the Messiah, he's the one that's been prophesied. So this sign is pointing to that end. So as we keep that whole thing in context, as we go through this, this ch uh, passage of Scripture, hopefully we will get a great understanding of the new covenant this morning and how wonderful that is. So the first point I want to make is this that the new covenant is for all people. The new covenant is for all people. And one thing I have done intentionally, uh, as you will see, the opening slide and this one, all have apple pie on it. One of those reasons is because apple pie is my absolute favorite dessert. I, um, we went over to uh, Miss Pansy's house, and I ate probably 15 plates of uh, fried apples at her house. I love apples. But secondly, I did really well to try to compact this into 40 minutes. So if you look at your watches because you're ready to leave, I can extend it and make the food that much more of a punishment. So, <laughs> but we're going to work through this this morning. But the new covenant is for all people. So, so when we think about wedding ceremonies, we think about you go in, you listen to about 30 minutes or so of a sermon, maybe less. They do some kind of normal, like maybe pour sand or tie knots, and, and they pronounce them husband and wife, everybody claps, the bride goes out, and we go to some kind of reception, maybe for a couple of hours, um, and then we leave and go home. But the Jews didn't work this way. The Jews had weddings for days. Some, some scholars say maybe even up to a week is how long a wedding celebration would last for a... Um, Jew. So some of you fathers or mothers who have had young ladies get married, you're probably cringing at the thought of having to supply for people for an entire week of festivals. But take a deep breath because the groom was the one that was responsible for this, not the bride. So you guys are off the hook. Any of you that had 
fellas that got married, you would be responsible for a week of wedding celebration. But what happened here, it's not just that the wine runs out and the, and the uh, groom is getting embarrassed. They could be sued for this. This was a legal issue if they ran out of food and did not properly supply for the wedding because it was a shame to the groom. It was mainly a shame to the bride and her family for allowing her to marry a man who could not supply, and the father could sue him as a result of this. It was a very serious issue, and we don't know what Mary's involvement is. We have, we have no idea why she feels a need to help in this, but she feels compelled. She may have been part of the planning committee. She may have been a family member. We don't know. But this is what's interesting. She goes up to Jesus to ask him to help her. But if John is correct... This is the first miracle Jesus had done. So Mary has not seen Jesus do anything miraculous yet. She hasn't seen him walk on the water. She hasn't seen him calm the storm. She has not seen him make blind eyes open. It's much more likely that Mary asked Jesus to help because at this point she is probably a widow and Joseph has passed away. She's probably a single mom. She is probably someone who has had to struggle a bit and had to depend on her son Jesus. The text doesn't say that, but the last time we see Joseph is back when Jesus is in the temple. We don't hear any mention of his father ever again. So there's a good chance he probably passed away. And so she's just going up to her older son and she's like, you know, Jesus, I, this is a bad situation. You know, come help me. And this is what's fascinating with this text is the, his, the way he responds. Because my mind, if my mom's like, hey, Bruce, I need you to help me, I'd be like, sure, what do you need? But Jesus goes, woman, <laughs> What does your concern have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. I, as I read this text, I remember the first time, I was brought back to a time where my mother got after me for something, and I was little, and I hit her. She looked at me, and she hit me back. I looked at her, cocked my chest up. I said, that didn't hurt. She said, okay, come on, let's go, let's go to the bathroom. So we go to the bathroom, and... Uh, all exposed as I was at that moment, and uh, she made it hurt. <laughs> and as we walked out of the bathroom, she said, did that hurt? I was like, yes, ma'am, and I'm just crying and bawling. So when I read this text, and I think, okay, I'm going to respond to my mom that way. Woman, I'm waiting for a backhand to come at any moment when I say that. But the word woman there is not a derogatory statement as we would perceive it. It's much closer to like the southern idea of like ma'am, calling people ma'am, like yes ma'am, no ma'am. Um, you know, you, it's not something you necessarily say for endearment because you're close to them, but it's just a polite way of addressing someone in the south. But this is what's interesting though, is the what does your concern have to do with me part. This phrase in Greek is the identical phrase to the way the demons address Jesus when he comes on the shore and he says... Jesus, you know, son of David, what, what do you have to do with me? The, the time for my judgment has not come. This is the exact same language that is used with the demons towards Christ. This is the language of a rebuke. Jesus is saying, oh, hold on one second. Now, he's not being disrespectful. He's not against his mother, but he is saying, whoa, Mary, hold on. Woman, wait, or ma'am, wait. I have, I have something to say here. But what's so interesting is, Mary says, Jesus, we need help. There's a situation with a wedding. And Jesus says, hey, I'm going to talk about my crucifixion. The, the phrase, my hour has not yet come, is always used talking about the cross in the book of John. So Jesus answers with, hey, I haven't died on the cross yet. And you read this, you're like, what in the world does that have to do with anything at all? Like, why does Jesus say that? Why does Jesus not say, I'm not ready to do miracles, or I'm not ready to do that? But what's even more confusing is this. He turns around and does what his mom asked of him. So he's like, woman, what does it have to do with me? My hour hasn't come. All right, let's fix the problem. So when you think about it, it's like, what, what is Christ doing here? Why is Jesus saying this? And I would argue this. The reason Christ shifts to this idea of salvation is because he's telling Mary, look, I know you're my mom, but you don't get an inside, inside track for salvation. You don't get a free card to just come to me because you are my relative. My friends don't get a free track to salvation. My friends do not get an inside avenue to salvation. All come to me the same way. And you're like, well, where in the world are you getting that from in the text? 
If we go later in the text, Jesus cleanses the temple is the very next thing he does in the book of John. The people in the temple were setting up booths and doing a Chuck E. Cheese in the outer court, which was the court of the Gentiles. This is where you and I, if you're not Jewish, that would have been your area to worship, and the Jews had blocked the Gentiles from being able to worship in the temple. Jesus is saying, look, this is something for all people. Jews are not getting an inside track with the new covenant. Family's not getting an inside track with the new covenant. Only faith brings you unto salvation. Only by believing in me will you be saved. So how many of you guys get, like, edgy if you feel like um, someone gets in front of you or breaks in front of you in line? Maybe you guys are perfectly sanctified. I am not. So one of them I struggle with is this. When I go to a restaurant, they hand me one of those little, zzz, zzz, little buzzer things. And they say, it's going to be a 20 or 30 minute wait or whatever. And I say, okay, that's fine. So I sit down and I'm talking with my family. And like I hear someone's buzzer go off. And I look and I'm like, whoa, they got here after me. I was here before that family. So, so it starts buzzing and I'm getting, I'm getting itchy. It's like, well, maybe it's just one. Then the next table hits. I know they were here after me. I don't know if they were or not, but in my mind they were. And so I'm like, I know they were here after me. So I'm getting my buzzer, and I'm like, I'm going to go up there. I bet you they forgot us. They totally forgot we're here, and we're going to have to wait another hour. I'm going up there. So I just walk up. I'm stomping, and then it goes, zzz, zzz. I'm like, oh, table's ready. Come on. And, and you go up to the hostess, and they're like, hey, was, how was your wait? Oh, it's fine. It was great. Thank you. The whole time I'm just ready to just strangle someone and go flip tables. Maybe you guys are more calm than that. That is a struggle of mine. The Lord is working on me. But we do get edgy when we think someone's getting priority or getting the inside track. And Jesus is saying, look, mother, I love you. You're my mom, and he still addresses the concern. That's the kind of care Jesus had for his mom. But he's making a point. My mission is about to start. My ministry is about to start. And only through faith will men be saved. And by no other means is what Jesus is saying here. So first, the new covenant is for all people. And, and what's so interesting is we see Mary responding in faith at the end of verse 5 when she says, whatever he says to you, do it. I'm giving up. I'm, I'm not involved in this one anymore. I'm trusting my son. I'm putting faith in my son. Let him handle it. So she is responding in faith, which is also interesting is this is the last sign you see of her in this text. She's not mentioned anymore. Mary doesn't say, hey, this is a great idea. You did good, Jesus. Nor, in verse 11, does it say the mother of Jesus and the disciples had faith. She's not mentioned anymore. She does not have that inside track to Jesus. Only by faith do we have this. Next thing is this. The new covenant is for sinful people. Not only is it for all people, but it's for sinful people. So if you're an all person or a sinful person, the new covenant is for you. So I think that includes everybody unless you have some kind of strange... Uh, situation in life. But it's for all people and sinful people. So, so it talks about these water pots, and if you read it, you're just kind of like, okay, he used some, the, you know, whatever from the kitchen to fill up. But that's not what these things are for at all. These are not just some vases that they put water in. These are ceremonial washing pots. These things were like holy pots. It's kind of like if I were to call the ushers up and say, fellas, I'd like you to come and, and lay the offering plates up front. And, and deacons, I want you to go get the guacamole and, and the salsa and, you know, and go get the taco dip. And we're going to fill up the, the offering plates. And we're going to go dip chips and eat today. How many of you guys would say, you know what, I think that Bruce is a good guy. That's good use of offering plates to use them for taco dip. Or I'm like, you know what, it's great. We're going to have a pool party for the kids. We're going to fill up the baptistry. We're going to put a water slide in there and water guns. And we're just going to have fun back here this morning. We'd be like, whoa, these things are sacred. This is, this is something that's set aside for holiness. This is what these pots are. These things are set aside because this is what happened. The Jews were commanded, and, and they criticized Jesus' disciples for not doing this, but they're dirty people. They understand this. God said, you're messed up. You're dirty. You're sinful. So you need to wash your hands. You need to get the, the yucky off because you're a sinful person that's messed up. You need to get all that mess off of you. So, so just get it off. Get it off. And, and for many of us, that's, that's what faith is like for us. That's what our Christian walk is like. It's kind of this idea of moralism that I have to do this, 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 and this to be in right standing with Jesus. Like if I don't, if I don't 
dress this certain way, if I don't say this certain thing, if I don't conduct myself in a certain way, if, if when I'm around people who are Christians or when I walk in the church building, if I don't have on this certain persona, then, then something's wrong and I'm not in favor with God. But just take a deep breath and realize, if God's given us our report card on how, how well we do in life, all of us are going to probably end up with a C or below. It's okay. We're average. Jesus is the only one that's good. It's okay. And you, know, and you look and you're like, well, Johnny seems to have his whole life together. My, my kids are a hot mess. Or, or, you, know, uh, or you, know, uh, you know, these other retired people, they seem to always be enjoying themselves. I can't get anything done. And, and, you, and you're like, what do I do? And, and, you're, and you're struggling and you're looking at everyone else. Just to let you know, those people that seem to have everything together are also just average. And they have their problems. And they have their struggles. But what we do is we think, I gotta be clean enough, I gotta be good enough, I gotta, I, I, you know, if I do this, I'm messed up, or if someone sees this, it's gonna, it's gonna be nasty, and they're gonna think different of me, so let me, let me get it off. And, and you spend your time washing yourself, and, it, and so let's say that we're in the situation, and, and we go to this wedding, and we, we get ourselves spotless, and there on the table, since we're Jewish, is a nice thing of barbecued chicken. I realize I couldn't say barbecued pork this morning, because that's not very kosher for a Jew, but there's a thing of barbecued chicken. And you begin to eat it. Your hands are going to be dirty again. You have stickiness. And guess what you're going to have to do? You have to go back and you have to, you have to wash it off again. And it's this whole process. And the thing is, you never really get clean that way. But this is what Jesus does. He takes these ceremonial jars that have been for, for washing off the yucky. And he turns it into the new wine of the new covenant. He turns it into the, the, the bowls of grace that are abundant and overflowing. And I, I wrote this statement here that, that we go to wash away the dirt, but instead we drink of amazing grace and we have freedom from sin. This is what Jesus does in the new covenant. We, 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 we go to try to get ourselves just clean enough and, and get it all off. And we go to, to drink we go to wash off, but instead Jesus is like, no, no, drink of the living water. Drink of the new covenant. Drink of salvation. Drink of grace. Now, this does not give us reason to sin, and we'll unpack this a little later. Paul says, should, should we keep on sinning so that grace may abound? Surely not in Romans 6. But Jesus realizes, God realized, we're never going to be able to do it on our own. We're never going to get clean enough on our own. We're never going to be good enough on our own. We can wash as much as we want to, and we can scrub and scrub and scrub. But the more we scrub, the dirtier we get. The more we try to be good, the worse we get. The only thing that fixes the sin problem in your life is the grace of Jesus Christ. And Jesus came to save sinners. He says that. He is Jesus. For instance, I did not come, I did not come to condemn. I didn't come to do this. I came to seek and save the lost is what Christ came for. So it's, it's a covenant for all people, but it's also the new covenant is for sinful people. Thirdly is this, the new covenant is the only way. And I know that's not a favorable thing to say in our pluralistic society. That's not something that's okay to say in our politically correct society. But here's the thing, it's not a bigotous, evil thing to say that. That does not mean that, you know, don't judge me. I'm not, bro. I'm, I'm, reading, I'm reading the text. Jesus said that. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. I didn't come up with that one. I didn't say that one. Jesus said that one. And so, this is what's so interesting, is, is the, the, the host of the wedding, kind of like the head chef, is who tries the wine. And he says, whoa, hold on. You save the best for last. What's up with that? So it's kind of like, for me, I love cheese. Like, it's just one of those, I like apple pie and cheese, which I don't know if that would be good together. I might need to try that. But I love cheese, and I like really rich, strong cheeses that make most people gag. I just, I love strong cheese. But if I were to stuff my mouth with like 30 pieces of like Velveeta from Walmart, I'm going to have this like paste on my mouth. I'm going to have this taste. And I go to eat an expensive, fine piece of cheese, and I can't taste it. And it tastes like mush. And that's what they're saying. Look, your, your taste buds are dead. They're destroyed by this point. So we give the first, the best first, and then we save the, the, the latter, latter stuff, the junk, for later. And Jesus addresses this because in the Jewish mind, 
they had the best already. They, they had the law. They had the prophets. They had everything. They had the temple. They were the pinnacle of God's people. They were everything God wanted. We, you know, the Pharisees talk about it. They say, don't, not only do we, do we tithe what we're supposed to, we tithe out of our spice rack. You know, we got it. We've got the best stuff already. And Jesus says, no, 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 no. You don't get it at all. You think what you have had is the best, but really everything you've had to this point has been inferior to the new covenant that's now in me. Everything that you have experienced, these laws, these ways, they are completely inferior to what I am about to do on the cross for you. Jesus says, look, I saved the best for last, the title of the sermon. God could have fixed it immediately. He could have fixed it at that moment, but in the fullness of time, he sends Christ. In Galatians, we see that because that's when God's ready for the big feast. That's when God's ready to do the new thing. That's when God's ready for this. And Jesus comes and says, look, I understand this has been your life. This has been your tradition. And I know this may be overwhelming, but the new covenant is something completely different, guys. And there's a, there's a common kind of like parable story um, that we see in a lot of Mideastern thought where they say, look, all religions are really the same. We're all trying to get to God the same way. We think that's a new idea that we put on bumper stickers with the Coexist movement, but it's been around for thousands of years. But this is the way they say it. So there's an elephant, and there's three blind men. And one blind man comes up, and, and he grabs the tail, and they say, what do you feel? He says, well, I feel a rope. You know, this is, this is some kind of rope I can use for work. The next blind man comes up and feels the tusk, and he says, oh, this is some kind of stone for, for sculpting and building. Then the third guy, blind man, comes up and fills the ear and says, oh, this is something soft for like a fabric to, to knit with. And so they say, see, they're really all right in their own way. And all of them are really feeling the elephant. But here's the issue. If you grab an elephant's tail hard enough, mistaking it for a rope, it's going to attack you. I don't care how much you think that is a rope. It is an elephant that is going to squash you. It is a mammoth beast that can kill you. You play with its tusk long enough, you're going to get hurt. You tug on its ear long enough, you're going to get hurt. Regardless of what you think is right, does not change the fact of what is actually right. Regardless of your opinion of what truth is, does not change what truth is. Truth is not subjective, but is objective, and it is found in God. And so, C.S. Lewis has a, 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 just a fantastic quote, he says, that Jesus was either a liar... He was a lunatic or he was Lord. So these are the, this is the only three options you have for Christ. Either Jesus absolutely lied his entire time as the Savior and was like, oh yeah, I'm the son of God, I'm this, I'm that, knowing he wasn't. And he was the biggest deceiver in the history of mankind. Or, C.S. Lewis says, Jesus could have been just a lunatic. Go to any... Um, insane asylum, there are many people who think they're Jesus. It's very common. There are people that aren't even in insane asylums that if you work in the health field, they will tell you, I'm Jesus. You know, they, they think that way. There's a guy right now that has a huge ministry in Mexico that says, I'm Jesus, and he has billions of dollars given to him because he says he's Jesus. So, he could have been that. He could have just been crazy. Or, just maybe, just, just follow me for a second. Maybe God actually placed a child in the womb of a virgin, Mary. Maybe that child grew up in the instruction of his parents. Maybe that child was the one that actually did turn water into wine here. And maybe he actually did all these miracles. And, and maybe he actually was hung on a cross. And maybe he was put in the grave. And, and maybe he came from the grave alive and then he ascended, glorified into heaven and now sits at the right hand of the Father as our intercessor. If that happened... And that Jesus says that he is the way, the truth, and the life, that no one comes to the Father except through him. That's not bigotry, that's truth. I can't change my opinion on that. I can't, I, I can't say, well, yeah, you know, we can agree to disagree. I can't do that. I'm a Christian. And if I believe the word is true, I don't have that option. I can only say, look, there's not. Christ is the only way. That's not me being cruel. That's not me being unloving. That's me trying to share the good news with people. I believe salvation is the good news for a reason, because I believe it's lost, and without Christ there is no hope. That, you know, it's, and we, we tend to veer from the gospel because we're like, oh, i got to tell people about hell and sin. 
That's not the gospel. That's your default position because we're fallen people. The gospel is God saving us from that. That's great news that the God of the universe takes enough time to give up his one and only son to die for people like me. That's good news. And, and we kind of get this idea, another illustration, you'll see they'll say, well, there's all these different paths. All these religions are just different paths. And at the top, there's a God. And really, they're all saying the same thing. Allah, Buddha, Krishna, Jesus, whatever you want to call it. They're really the same thing, and we're just getting different paths. But I don't know if you're like me, but every time I've tried to climb up that mountain, I find myself slipping back down it. Every time I've tried to be good enough, I realize that I'm not. And, and, and it's like a mudslide constantly. And I tried to grab, and I tried to climb and be as good as I could be, but I was always never good enough. See, Christianity doesn't affirm that you have to be good enough to get up the mountain to God. Christianity says that God came down to the bottom of the mountain to pick us up and do what we could not do. It is completely different from anything else. It is distinctive from anything else. And that is why it's the only way. It's the only thing that is crazy enough to even work. Like, I can rationalize a God who hates me if I don't do X, Y, and Z. I can rationalize a God who, who is going to condemn me if I don't do these things. I can't rationalize a God who kills his only son for someone like me. Makes zero sense. But that's the kind of loving God we serve. Doesn't now give us some kind of free ticket, but it's a new life that begins to transform us. That's found in God. Fourthly, the new covenant glorifies God. So not only is it for all people, for sinful people in the only way, but it is ultimately for the glory of God the Father. So let's look again at verse 11. This beginning of signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his, now catch this, his glory and his disciples believed in him. His disciples had faith in him. So you're like, well, I thought you just said the point was that it's for the, covenant, for the glory of God, right? I mean, I thought that's what it was about. You don't have to flip there, but John 17, 1, I'm going to read this real quick. Jesus spoke these things and looked, looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Back to the reference of what he says to his mother. My hour has not yet come. Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so that the son may glorify you. This is done so Jesus can be glorified. So when the hour that has come that is spoken of earlier in the text happens, all the glory goes back to the Father. You see, Jesus submits to the will of the Father. He does everything to the will of the Father. And in the story of Scripture, if you want Scripture in a nutshell, these 66 books are about Jesus being so much better than. So Jesus is the greater Adam. He's greater than Abraham. He's greater than Isaac. He's greater than Jacob. He's the greater temple. He's the, he's the greater feast. He's the greater lamb. That's what the book is about. But creation is designed for the glory of the Father. So we see God's glory through the glory of the Son. We glorify God because we are saved by Him. But this is what's so interesting with, with glorifying God. And we kind of use those terms and it's like, Oh, glory, and this is something we do in worship. No, 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 no. We glorify God with our lives. We glorify God with the way we live. And this is what happens. So as I begin to glorify God, God begins to transform my desires. And when my desires are transformed, I begin to live differently. I begin to think differently. And as I think differently, I find more joy in my life because I'm living the way God made me to live. And so as I do that, I'm like, oh, God is so much better than anything I've ever had. I need to love him more. I need to worship him more. And our lives begin to be transformed more. And the closer we grow, grow to God, the happier we will be. It is all about your joy. But it's not about you feeling good. It's because when you live the way God made you to be, that's the most joy you will ever have in your life. There is nothing more joyful than that. The, the catechism, though we are not Presbyterian. It says that, that we were created for the glory of God and to enjoy him forever. That's what it's about. But through the work of Jesus Christ, we are, we are just brought into this... We look at Jesus and we look at grace. And, and just like this, this master of the wedding feast, he tastes this wine and says, Whoa, what is this stuff? 
What is this stuff that I'm drinking? I've never had anything like this. That's what the new covenant's like. You live in a broken world and your life's messed up and, and you taste of this and you're just in amazement of, whoa, what is this Jesus thing? What is this, what is this salvation thing? What is this, this incredible thing called grace? What is this? This is what Christ is doing. Salvation is, is not for your pleasure, but your pleasure is for the glory of, of God. And I'll conclude with this. We, we have an understanding that Jesus is this like sovereign sheep petter on pictures. Like he just kind of sits there and he's like, oh, and just like rubs, strokes a sheep and he's got like a little halo on his head and he's got flowing brown hair and we're just like, oh yeah, look at, look at that picture of Jesus. He's, he's so solemn and holy. He's like, yes, come. Come unto me all who are weary and heavy laden. I'll let you pet my sheep. No, that's... That's, that's not what happens here. You see, Jesus absolutely is about his glory. Jesus is absolutely about being glorified for the sake of the Father. And furthermore, this. Jesus' first miracle is done at a wedding. He could have done it in an isolated area. He could have done it somewhere where... No one was around or just his few disciples and had kind of this little commune. And he could have been like, come and I'm going to tell you about the things of the Lord. It's not what Jesus does. He's at a celebration. And when he first reveals his works, he is at a wedding. And this is what's fabulous as we tie this together. When we look at the book of Revelation, we look at Ephesians. The church is the bride of Christ. And, and Christ builds up his bride in, in splendor for the glory of the Father. And here's the thing. Like when you go to a wedding, I've never been to a wedding where there's an ugly bride. I've never like, they've never like opened up the doors and I'm like, oh, junk, and like hide in the seat. That, that doesn't happen. I've never had that, ex- I've never had that experience. I've never had that happen. But Jesus prepares a bride who is beautified and perfect and holy for the Father. You see, what Jesus is doing in the wedding, he says this, look, it's not about some kind of, some kind of you know, monastic kind of, we're all solemn all the time. Salvation is about you experiencing joy you have never experienced before and experiencing grace that you didn't even know existed and living in the fullness of the new covenant and living the abundant life. Heaven is going to be awesome. It's not going to be floating on clouds with angel wings playing harps. It's going to be exactly what we were supposed to be forever. And God restoring that. It's going to be amazing. And as a Christian, as we drink of this new covenant, instead of trying to fix it ourselves and we just drink of the grace of Jesus, we, we come in to him and have eternal life. And we say, oh, yeah, yeah, when I die, I get eternal life. No, the Bible doesn't teach it that way. It teaches that a Christian never dies. That you go from life to life as a believer. You have already started your eternal destination with God. You've already started your eternal life as a Christian. Yes, you will physically take your last breath, but you will take it, and your eyes will be opened through a door that's paper thin, no dimensions. And you're in the presence of God living forever. And glorifying him. And and with the angels as they sing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We will have that forever. And it's because Jesus came and that messy pot that had all of our filth in it took all of that junk upon himself and in return gave us grace of the new covenant. And not only gave it to us, but it's abundant and overflowing. I'm going to, um, wasn't planned on doing this, but I'm going to sing a song, um, a Revelation song, which is a fabulous piece. Um, I encourage you, if you are a believer and just need a refreshing of grace, you're more welcome to come forward. If you are a non-believer, come forward. I'll be glad to talk to you. But more importantly, just where you are, just take this time to enjoy the blessing of the new covenant. As we're going into the Christmas season and we're going to discuss the the amazing, life-changing gospel that we has found in Christ. 
take this time to reflect on what's about to happen, that this little baby is not just a baby, but this is the new covenant, the Son of God who comes to save the world and seek and save sinners. So I just ask you this morning to do that. Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. And holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing, Praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. Heavenly Father, we are we are so grateful that this new covenant is just abundant and overflowing. And even while we were broken and messed up. As, as Paul says, even while we were still sinners, you come to die for us. We thank you for that, Lord. Let us be refreshed in the wonder of your grace. In your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. You can be dismissed. <laughs>